we need to be able to have conversations without feeling like we're going to say something that gets us thrown in jail because people happen to be offended. All right, dudes, we are live with another Pain Burn podcast. We are back. It's podcast number 58. We're getting up there in age, you know. Um, thank you for being with us today. Very excited for today's guest. Um, today, I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Brian Keating. Brian Keating is a Chancellor's Distinguished Professor of Physics at the Center for Astrophysics and Space Sciences, CASS, in the Department of Physics at the University of California, San Diego. He is a public speaker, inventor, and an expert in the study of the universe's oldest light, the Cosmic Microwave Background, CMB, using it to learn about the origin and evolution of the universe. Keating is a writer and podcaster and the best-selling author of one of Amazon Editor's best nonfiction books of all time, Losing the Nobel Prize. Just making sure my volume's up here. Interesting. Welcome, Dr. Brian Keating. How's it going today? Awesome. Oh, okay. I got audio breaking here. Uh, sorry. Two seconds. I got to shut down OBS and restart it. <laughs> exactly. Update. Been there. All right, guys, the uh, audio should be better now. Hopefully that's good for you. I'm going to also record just because it did that blip. Um, start Do I sound okay out there? Yeah, y- yeah, you sound you okay. sound great uh, to okay. me. It's just that, oh, okay, we, we fixed it. Okay, okay, sweet. Okay, guys, we are live with Dr. Brian Keating. I'm very excited for this. Um, I oh, By the way, I do really enjoy your podcast. Guys, check out Into the Impossible podcast. Just search Dr. Brian Keating. I noticed, Brian, you don't have your a cool like YouTube.com forward slash Brian Keating yet. Is that coming? Oh, no, I do. Oh, you I do? Thought, yeah. yeah, Dr. Brian Keating. Oh, it's okay. Oh, yeah. okay. Cool. I'm in the chat I room, if people want to click on my face, they'll get to my channel, I think. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I, tr- I try to, I don't know. Maybe I'm just. Uh, oh, yeah. I'll put a link in. Okay. Cool. Um, well, let's start off with what got you interested in physics? I, I always love hearing the origin stories of our scientists of today. Yeah, especially those that study cosmology, right? right? So people always say, you know, why why study cosmology? And I say, well, it takes you from the smallest things in the universe, particles, forces, fields, photons, quarks, neutrinos, all the way up to the biggest things in the universe. And no aspect of the universe, including our existence as living, conscious, technological organisms, is outside the purview of cosmology. I've been fascinated with it since I was 12 years old, uh, when I was an altar boy in the Catholic Church in uh, in, uh, Westchester County, New York. Uh, I should have been studying for my bar mitzvah at the time, because I'm actually Jewish, but uh, that's a separate story. And I became entranced by a small device like this, a small telescope. And I was using it to observe the universe as a, you know, basically out of pure curiosity. One night I woke up, saw the moon was out and I was like, wow, it's super bright. And there's this there's this plane next to it. And the plane is it's not blinking. It's lights aren't blinking. You know, I was pre pre uh, premonition about these UFO sightings that are in the news. We could talk about that some other time. (laughs) But the uh, but the sighting of this of this bright, bright object, this star, I thought it was if it's not blinking. Uh, must be a pl- it might not be a plane, could be a star. Over a couple of days, the moon and the star were always next to each other or close to each other. I thought, that's weird. Um, let me look it up and uh, let me just search on Google. And this was 1985. Uh, so I, I was like, uh, I could wait 14 years until Sergey and Larry invent Google, or um, I could uh, go to the New York Times 
And that was research back then. If you think about Travis, nowadays, everybody's spoiled. We can search on YouTube. We can search on Google, we can on Wikipedia. <laughs> I couldn't do that. So I had to wait until Sunday, you know, five days later. And I got the New York Times, looked it up in the back. They used to have a section, Cosmos. And it was the planet Jupiter. Mm. And I was like, holy crap, that's amazing. You can see a planet. You don't need a spaceship. I mean, this is right before the Voyager spacecraft were heading out there. And I was just fascinated by it. And I decided then and there I wanted to spend my life learning more about the cosmos. And that took me to a journey that leads me into where I am today at UC San Diego uh, and also co-directing the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. Cool. Uh, and something that blows my mind just about where we're at with technology, because you brought up research and I mean, we can all access uh, uh, scientific research papers now and and, and the, the accepted peer reviewed, uh, you know, consensus papers that have really good reviews. Um, but I, I uh, uh, something that blows my mind, I was watching some videos recently of people just with their their uh, I think it's their telephoto lenses that they're attaching to their SLR cameras and they can actually like just see, uh, uh, get a pretty good image of Saturn now, uh, just with their, with their, uh, you know, their SLR cameras. And I think that's just, that, that, that blows yeah. my mind. I mean, look, they didn't have Amazon back then either. I mean, you can get this telescope <laughs> for 29. I'm thinking, you know, Travis, maybe we'll go into business together, but, you know, having Keating brand telescopes, because everyone always asks me, tell me a recommendation for a telescope that's under a thousand dollars. I'm like, you don't need a thousand dollar telescope. Literally, Travis, yeah. with this telescope, with this twenty nine ninety nine. 99 uh, telescope. You can see every single crater on the moon that Galileo saw. You can see every single ring of Saturn that Galileo saw, Ju the moons of Jupiter that Galileo. In other words, you can see all these things that not only fascinated people um, back 400 years ago, like Galileo, but he talked to someone like I've had Neil deGrasse Tyson on my show, and he's talked about his upbringing in the South Bronx in, in right. New York City uh, with a telescope. So let's not delude ourselves that make the barrier seem too high to entry to the wisdom and the vision of becoming potentially interested in STEM. Now, I say becoming possible because Galileo was not just a scientist. He was an artist. His father was a musician. Yes. Um, and Galileo was very interested in music as well. But, um, but he was also an artist. He was a visual sketch artist. So even if you don't get into STEM, you can maybe get into STEAM with a telescope. Just sketch the things you see and a little sketchbook with a pencil and paper. That's exactly what Galileo did. And we're still pouring over his things 410 years later. It's, it's just unbelievable what we can do nowadays. And we don't, we don't take advantage of it the way we should, I feel. Yeah. I tend to focus on the artistic inspirational power of these scientific figures of the past, because I really think it's the artistic inspirational power of their brain that allows them to step above the other, uh, you know, scientific or math, mathematical uh, geniuses of the time and allows them to rise above that certain level because of their uh, imagination and how they're able to artistically conceptualize their, um, you know, the, uh, what they're working on. And Einstein is a great example of that with uh, general relativity. Um, okay. Now were your, were your parents interested in, uh, in physics or did they have an interested interest in cosmology or was there any inspiration there for you? They did, but they weren't uh, in inspiring me. Actually, my father was a was a you know world famous mathematician. Uh, however, he and my mother got divorced when I was seven. I never saw him again for another fifteen years. So even though he was a professor, uh, one of the youngest tenured professors at Cornell in their history um, in math, I didn't see him, and he wasn't an influence on me directly. Um, my mother, you know, it's not her real strong suit with science, but she, she would tolerate me like blowing stuff up in the kitchen or mixing up, you know, some deadly pesticides out of, you know, household chemicals yeah. or trying to win, you know, a science fair by inventing a, um, you know, an odorless, soundless explosive that I almost ended up, uh, you know, killing myself with. You know, that but, reminds um, me of Michio Kaku building his, this atom smasher in his mom's garage, which he talks about a lot. <laughs> Yeah. And like shutting down the power and all of the yeah. Bay Area. <laughs> um, so for me, no, it wasn't that it was more self-directed, which I always say, you know, uh, people say, follow your passion. You ever hear that, Travis? Follow your passion. Sure. I actually think that's not great advice. I say follow your curiosity. Passion's like a spark. But curiosity is the rocket fuel that will take you yeah. to where you're going to go. 
and sustain you when you know passion it's like passion is basically an external metric that others outside yeah. of you judge you by and doesn't allow you to choose yourself as my friend james mm. altucher says so uh, but, but, but but nobody can determine your own curiosity yeah it's what fascinates you and that will sustain you not just this temporary high of like oh i'm yeah. passionate about like video editing like i go through all these passions my kids go through passions it usually doesn't last but what they're curious about that persists so my motto on my channel is abc always be curious mm. Yeah, and I think one uh, a way to fundamentalize this, uh, even maybe one step down, is inspiration. I think I think there will be things that uh, we're we're either inspired about or things that inspire us and there are things that don't inspire us like some people do not get inspired by uh the canucks playing the rangers uh in a hockey game on saturday night but i do uh but <laughs> but there you know p p people it's one of the most fascinating things when i look at humanity and i just love humanity but the but the 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 vast spectrum of of things that inspire uh each of us and and how different that does uh make us from one another uh, a qu question about physics. Were you first um, introduced to uh, like new Newtonian uh, classical mechanics or or uh, d did quantum mechanics uh, come into your education at an early stage? And, and what did you think about quantum mechanics when you started looking at it? That's really interesting you asked that question. So I, I was actually a pretty uh, mediocre student. Uh, when I was this age, 12 years old, 13 years old. And this is why curiosity is so much more important than passion. If I followed what I was passionate about, I'd be playing a Commodore 64, Atari 2600, things you guys out there, many of you don't even know existed. Um, that was what I was <laughs> passionate about. But what I was curious about was the universe, the stars, planets, and galaxies that my small telescope was revealing. Um, little did I know that would take me to the career that I have today. Uh, certainly the path was uh, very, um, very meandering, and we can talk about that. But from the perspective of no, I didn't learn about quantum mechanics early on. In fact, I could barely learn classical mechanics because I wasn't put, Travis, on track to get me into calculus. I was a public school kid in uh, upstate New York, as I said, Westchester County. And I was uh, not placed. I wasn't thought to be that good at mathematics. And in truth, I'm not that great at mathematics. Ironically, my father is this world famous mathematician. But as I said, he was not in my life for most of my youth and developmental period. So I had to teach myself. And I was a real self-starter. And I knew to determine one thing that really fascinated me was how far away are these objects? I was looking at Jupiter. Yeah. I was looking, how did I know Jupiter, which kind of looks the same brightness as the planet, as the star Sirius? How do I know if Sirius is so much farther away than the uh, planet Jupiter? Well, then I had to learn calculus. Okay, well, I'm 13 years old. I'm not, I'm in algebra. I'm not in pre calculus track in a public school. How am I going to do that? Oh, you have to learn pre calc. Oh, what's pre calc? Series, limits, fu functions. Uh, what's what's before the pre-calc? Oh, it's trigonometry. Oh, I have to learn trigonometry. So it's all this stuff, Travis, that I wasn't set up to be on track to learn. I had kind of like a disability, maybe because my father was a brilliant mathematician and he abandoned me that I felt like, oh, I, I'm never going to become anything. So I had a block against math. But then when I realized math was integral, no pun intended, to my curiosity, then I started to be just self-taught. I have to learn trigonometry. I, learn I was just going to mention autodidactism. <laughs> it is, you know, but you can't like tell someone to be an autodidact. No, like, you can't. You want to be. Yeah, but yeah. You could, the good thing is nowadays with YouTube and, and like I've seen your oh, challenges yeah. explode, you have this free resource. You and I and, and others are making a free university that kids in their 12s and 13s, you know, early teens, they can attend in their pajamas, you know, as opposed to doing, you know, what other kids are doing nowadays and kind of getting, you know, they'll be left behind the kids that are truly passionate and curious so no i had to learn first calculus i became fascinated with with um isaac newton and i tried stupidly to read the principia which is like completely unreadable um but i luckily found galileo who is masterful at the art of literature as well as scientific argumentation in a way using socratic dialogues and other formats that even a kid could understand Whereas Newton almost wrote in code. Actually, I have an uh, interview on my channel today airing with Stephen Strogatz, Professor Stephen Strogatz um, of Cornell University. Cornell, which rejected me many times. Uh, but uh, but nevertheless, Cornell. Uh, Why did they reject you? Um, like I said, I wasn't a great student. I did. Right. I ended up doing better on the calculus AP exam than right. anybody else in my grade. Shout out to my buddies who are watching from North Salem High School. Uh, but nevertheless, um, it wasn't like at the. I was on the wait list. I probably could have got it. And I didn't want to drop. I didn't want to use my father's reputation to get in. I wanted to be self-made. 
And I didn't want to say, oh, my dad's a prof- was a professor there. You know, yeah. I, I didn't feel like that was earning it. And I wanted, and I ended up going to a much better school for me, which is called Case Western Reserve University, Go Spartans, Cleveland, Ohio. I got a full ride there. Um, and, uh, and because of that, I got introduced to astronomy, engineering, and physics. And then that led me to go to grad school and then eventually go to become a professor. So my perspective is you, you want to break it down into chunks. And what Steven Strogatz does, I wish he existed or I knew about him back in the 80s. He existed, of course. But this book that he's written is called Infinite Powers. Travis, I recommend it to everybody, even, even besides my book, okay? This book, if you're at all interested in math, physics, um, if you have a block, a barrier, an impediment, towards learning something in STEM, get it for you. I got it for my father-in-law who's like, has nothing to do. He doesn't know. He never took calculus. He never took, he's smart. He's, he's, he's a wise man, but um, he, he devoured this book. He's bought multiple copies for his friends. They're all retired. This is amazing. Uh, this book, infinite powers, it traces like the way you should be taught calculus. Mm. And so I wish that book existed, but guess what? Now it does. And now videos like interviews with me and him and you and me and all these things are available. So people need to take advantage of it. And my belief is that, you know, if if I'm not obsolete in a few decades, you know, if my if my career as a professor is not over because of the ability to be autodidactic and to and to glean the information that's just now emerging with machine learning and artificial intelligence pedagogy, then something's wrong. So there's either going to be you know, augmentation where I'll be in the classroom here. And then all of a sudden I'll say, you know, look at the pale blue dot image. Well, that was made by, you know, Carl Sagan. Here's <laughs> Carl Sagan finger puppet over there. So also the Cornell. Pale blue dot. <laughs> yes. That's my feeling. You know, I think we're at a precipice of an exciting new development, a true paradigm shift in education. Cool. Well, a little bit more about you. Uh, I, I love asking this question. It, it fascinates me. What inspires you artistically? Hmm. So I'm inspired artistically primarily by uh, by music in terms of like what can move me emotionally. Uh, I think artistically it's it's less in the visual arts nowadays. The musical arts, I think, are more deep uh, in that music. If you think about it, Travis is kind of one dimensional unless you like listen at 2x or something. I listen to podcasts and audiobooks at 2x. I don't think you can listen to much music at 2x speed or whatever. So therefore you're hearing it the way the composer or the artist or the musician wants you to hear it. And I find that very evocative, very emotional because there's nothing visual. It's pure auditory. It's directly connecting into your brain with headphones and spatial audio. Mm. And for me, that it'll make me much more emotional than seeing a painting. Like I joke with Steven in the podcast, you know, like no one ever looks at the Mona Lisa cries like, cause they makes them feel like they might cry over how beautiful it is. But, you know, that's the same way you might cry over a beautiful sunset. It's not necessarily the intrinsic to the artist. It's more the medium. Um, whereas with music, people get very emotional. Or it's very evo- I can remember where I heard a first a song for the first time and you get this in your mind and you never have that with with visual arts. You never have like, oh, I've got Michelangelo's David and I just can't get it out. It's like an eye worm. No, there's no saying eye worm. It's earworm. It gets into your brain and you can't right. get out of it. So music to me is that highest form. Unfortunately, um, my, my wife plays instruments. My kids play instruments. I play the iPhone and that's about it. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned being an altar boy, but did you, did you grow up singing in the, in the choir or? No, no, no. They wouldn't no. let me in. My voice uh, kept me out. Yeah. <laughs> they were like, we'll let you in. We know you're Jewish. We'll let you in. We'll let you be an altar boy, but, uh, no way we're letting the Keating guy sing anything. That's hilarious. Uh, do you, when you see people, uh, playing music or singing, do you wish that, you had a proclivity towards that or is, or are you, are you, are you just too busy with other things that, you know, you're happy? Oh yeah, to... definitely. You know, w- w- if wishes were, you know, would come true, I'd be a yeah. billionaire with six pack abs, you know, I mean, I'd be, <laughs> <laughs> you and I would be doing this interview from my uh, 800 foot mega yacht. In yeah, the, exactly. Uh, but, um, uh, but no, no, I, I don't, I, I mean, I don't find like retrospective, you know, con- uh, alternative history particularly useful other than to say, I don't want to make the same mistake with my kids. So I'm exposing them to it. My wife is much better at exposing them to music and visual arts. And they do it in, in school and they do it uh, after school activities, you know, piano lesson or whatever. But um, but for me, uh, I have it as a fantasy. And I'll every now and then I'll buy like a $50 guitar on Amazon and uh, and I'll just sit there. But hopefully my kids will pick it up because it's yeah. just like speaking a language. And the only language I can really speak is Fortran you know, other than English <laughs> and, uh, but that's language and that's a way of thinking about the universe. So yeah. at least I know that. And, 
as uh, as as Herman Woke, the great writer uh, of uh, of the Kane Mutiny and other things, um, he he uh, he used to call as Richard Feynman told him. He said, "You have to learn calculus because that's the language God talks." So in other words, mathematics is a way of looking at the universe, in particular, what we call differential equations and, and, um, and the calculus. Those are different ways of visualizing a language to help you interpret the natural world. And I use that every day. Yeah, the language of consistent relation. It's kind of a way, uh, way I put it. Um, you, you talked about being interested in the distance of things when you were talking about uh, Jupiter. So I think we should uh, jump into uh, talking about uh, the universe's oldest light, this cosmic microwave background, which is the topic, I believe, of your, your book, uh, Losing the Nobel Prize. Why don't you tell us a bit about your book? Yeah, so the book is a memoir. It's a uh, biography, autobiography in part, but it's also a, auto, a biography of the cosmos and how we've come to learn what we know about the so-called Big Bang model, the origin stories of the universe. And as I always say, you know, there are there are books written about you know superconductivity and um, you know electromagnetic um, waves and so forth. There are books written about that, but tend to be less popular or less evocative in the human imagination. Than books like A Brief History of Time, uh, you know, uh, yeah. the uh, the God Equation, you know, all these sorts of, of, of very grandiose, in a good way, scope topics. So my book is really how do we get to know the cosmos, not in the way your past guest, say, Brian Green has approached it from a theoretical uh, physicist point of view, but I'm an experimentalist. So I build telescopes with my team, with my group. We build telescopes, not that you can see with your eye, but which my colleagues build ultra sensitive detectors that we cool down near absolute zero and launch into space or take to the South Pole above me over there or put in the high Atacama Desert of Chile where the Simons Observatory is. And all of them are dedicated, Travis, in one way or another to unraveling the observational properties of the universe because we can talk all we want about you know hidden reality as my friend brian green who did endorse my book um or lisa randall talked about warp passages extra dimensions um or even jan 11 or leonard suskun they talk about you know the interior of black holes these are all inaccessible you can't get to observe them so i want to ask the question a young person coming into his or her own wants to learn about the universe but isn't maybe as mathematically gifted um, as some of these individuals or thinks that they're not or, or like I was as a kid, I would work on my 1979 Volkswagen Rabbit. Uh, I wasn't able to work on my, you know, on my uh, theoretical differential calculus. So for me, it's from an experimentalist perspective. How do we understand the data that then allow us to test and possibly disprove uh, um, aspects of our universe, including whether or not there was a Big Bang? That's the question that most fascinates me. And people in the lay public may not know this, but this is actually a topic of quite some debate, whether there was a single Big Bang or not, whether time had an origin or not, what the deep future of the cosmos will present to us. These are open questions for the first time accessible, not just to theologians, Travis, but to experimental, observational refutation or confirmation. Mm. So what would some of the... Uh, um arguments uh be what are some of the things that kind of point people in the direction that there may not have been a big bang mm. so uh so for many many millennia uh the pre prevailing paradigm in other words if you reach into it let's say you put every year of human civilization from 5000 bce till 2021 you write it on a ping pong ball and you put it in a bag so there's 7021 balls in there or something like that okay and then you pull out a ball at random the odds are about 99% that there'll be a ball, you'll pull out a year in which the public and every scientist who is practicing cosmology believe the universe was eternal. So if you think about that, there's a huge bias in our human psyche to think the universe is eternal from a scientific perspective. Einstein himself uh, believed the universe was eternal. I'm looking around for more of my dolls. I can't resist my dolls, Travis. Indulge me. For I a love it. I got uh, I got Darwin and uh, Shakespeare looking at me behind me. I love the dolls. You know, I only have one doll of the people. You know, I talk about Galileo a lot. So here's Galileo. Yeah, here's Galileo yeah. with his little telescope. So <laughs> Einstein himself thought the universe was eternal. And um, and had existed in its basically steady static state for all eternity. And he was led to believe that by his observations. The observations at the time suggested that the universe was static, unchanging, 
and eternal. And that was believed all the way back to uh, Aristotle, Archimedes, you know, the original Greek um, Roman philosophers and scientists. There was no reason to suspect otherwise. In fact, Einstein was led by a very strong belief in his own equations, the ones that had predicted the bending of starlight around the sun mm. due to its gravitational force. The same equations that he came up with to, to uh, that derived the anomalous precession of the planet Mercury as a as an um, influence and consequence of curvature of space time being modulated and modified by the presence of matter. So in other words, he had this brilliant idea that gravity is, is not a consequence of a force acting at a distance. It's actually because of the curvature of space causes trajectories to modify. Um, and yet, Travis, he was not willing to accept the conclusion that was buried in his equations that the universe was actually expanding, i.e. it was dynamic. It was changing with time. Mm. So for those reasons, uh, even the greatest, you know, and it's too bad because he could have had a good career. You know, he could have he could have been famous, Travis, if he just <laughs> didn't make that famous blunder. Uh, but nevertheless, the uh, the the notion that the universe is static uh, uh, persists to this day in different forms, not static, but quasi steady state. What does that mean? Well, quasi steady state means it's not quite steady state. It's sort of slowly modulating, slowly changing. And in the context of many of these adherents to alternatives to a singularity at the beginning of time, that's the main um, a conflict in cosmology. Mm -hmm. Was there a singularity uh, at the beginning, at the origin of time? Um, was there something else? And if it's something else, what are some of the possibilities? Well, the possibilities are still unknown, but uh, they involve... Uh, effectively a cyclical model where the universe undergoes a series of expansions and collapses, perhaps eternal. In other words, it could be, could be going on eternally throughout the uh, history of our universe to negative infinity in time, going forward to positive infinity in time. And we just happen to live in one cycle where the universe is expanding slowly, or it could have happened once, you know, it could have been just one universe before ours, who knows why could be that there is just a singular big bang, an origin, a single origin, and um, and or it could be that there's a multiverse where there's other universes, just as there are other stars, galaxies, planets, people. There are other universes in what's called the multiverse. All these things are fascinating and all of them for the first time in human history are subject to observational data and refutation. You might think what I do is prove things like Brian Greene comes up with an idea. There's 26 dimensions, uh, hidden dimensions in reality. Um, no, we don't prove that. We disprove everything else. Yeah, and more about false truth. falsification process. Um, so what do you currently believe then? Do you currently believe that, uh, you know, are, are you in the camp that uh, a Big Bang likely gave rise to uh, the our observable universe? Or uh, do, you, do, you, uh, do you have a positive belief? Um, well, no. So I have a video coming out on my channel uh, called uh, called The Faith of a Physicist. And uh, in it, I start off by saying, and I can uh, give a little shout out to uh, to your listeners. Um, we'll be able to watch it. Um, but the uh, the faith of a physicist starts off by saying, I don't believe in gravity. I don't believe in the theory of evolution. I don't believe in that the sun rises in the east. I have evidence for it. So we have to ask, what things do we have evidence for? And what things do we kind of want to believe that we don't have evidence for? And a lot of people do have faith in things like string theory, the multiverse. And to me, it's it has a lot in common with the with this kind of notion of of um, with the with the same kinds of notions of of almost religious dogma. In other mm. words, they're believed more without evidence than a proper scientist should, in my opinion. And so I go through and I present what are the uh, kind of competing hypotheses. And then at the end, I summarize by saying, how could you give evidence for the multiverse? And right. that will take it into the realm of proper scientific or, study from my experimentalist point of view. Or perhaps even better, proof positive for whatever claim you're willing to make about existence. Uh, I, I, you know, I find... You know, people will say evidence this, evidence that. Here's my evidence. Uh, right. This is evidence of X, and I and I just tend to say, come to me when you have a, a claim that you have proof positive for, and then then I'll be interested. But yeah, when I look at, I I kind of I agree I agree with you uh, with regards to like string theory. 
it's like there's when I'm looking for like okay what what can we predict here what what is this what are these equations uh, telling us and and really uh, I don't see any anything uh, tangible to them I see I see a you know a, a beautiful picture of possibility but I'm not interested in in uh, the realm of possibility because it's possible that gods exist it's possible that Zeus uh, gave rise and then and uh, farted and gave rise to the entire uh, cosmos. I think that's possible. I think it, so. I'm interested in plausibility, uh, uh, how how probable something is, um, and uh, and you know I think that'll that'll get us into uh, some things I want to talk to you about with regards to uh, gods. Um, but while we're while we're still on this um, uh, this topic, uh, it, there's a lot of theories of everything out there. Uh, you know, everyone's got one. Uh, there's, there's seems to be no, uh, new interesting demonstrations from these. Uh, I had Wolfram on, uh, recently and, uh, Stephen Wolfram, and I know you had, uh, Stephen Wolfram and, uh, Eric Weinstein on, which was very interesting. After, after you've, you've heard this, the collection of all these theories of everything, is there anything new and exciting that, that, has uh that has arise that you've been like wow okay this one actually has something going for it well you know i i um yes and no again my my feeling is that experimentalists need to be the sober kind of adults in the room and the theorists can be the wide-eyed you know speculative dreamers uh and the experimentalists need to understand the theory they don't need to create new theories but the converse isn't true. You know, my my uh, Brian Green, he doesn't know how to how to assemble a, you know, a 300 millikelvin cryogenic refrigerator system the way I do or my students do. And so there's a difference. There's a fundamental asymmetry between a, a theoretical physicist like a Stephen Hawking, Leonard Susskind, Brian Green, Stephen Wolfram, Eric Weinstein does versus what I do. And so that's the kind of niche that I'm hoping to exploit and demonstrate that there's a whole other side of things that people aren't getting. My line is that, you know, kind of uh, these theories of everything are really good about, you know, talking about theories of everything. In other words, string theory <laughs> is, is impressively um, uh, uh, prolific at describing string theory, the mathematics behind it. It's an incredible mathematical feat uh, for which, you know, folks like Ed Witten have won the Fields Medal, which is like the, no the Nobel Prize in mathematics. It's so highly mathematical. And yet um, the question becomes, how does it make contact with observation, with reality? Um, so right now, I also suffer from, I think we are suffering from the fact that there's kind of a stagnation that people may be skipping over um, lower obstacles on their way to this big obstacle. Because as people like Michio Kaku keep saying, uh, you know, that if you find the God equation, you know, if you solve it, you'll win a Nobel Prize and you'll do what Einstein couldn't do. In other words, you're setting it up as an authority susceptible bias where people can then say, well, I did what Einstein didn't do. So that's why I get all these emails, you know, mm. professor Keating, I have a theory of everything or professor Keating. I saw aliens, you know, whatever. Uh, right. And if you, sh if you, if you help me with the math, cause I'm not that good at math, um, we will, you know, surely win the Nobel prize and I will share it with you. My Nobel prize winning, not the medal. They always want the medal, um, but they'll <laughs> share some, some of the money. You know, all I have to do is, and I point out, I wasn't good in math. I, I didn't get the best score on the SATs. So from my perspective, an experimentalist needs to not have a, a chosen pet theory. Um, I have gone down that. I talk about that in losing the Nobel Prize, where we wanted to see this imprint of inflation, this early epoch that hypothet hypothetically ignited the uh, expansion of our universe in the, um, in the earliest moments, trillions of a second after the origin of time, perhaps. This theory, I wanted to believe it so bad that I, you know, kind of went along for the ride and, and was was part of this team that published this result eventually. And it was peer reviewed uh, eventually. And, and we made claims and those claims had to be retracted. And essentially that we didn't discover the origin of the universe. We discovered something much more prosaic, namely cosmic dust, uh, smaller particles than these meteorites I have here. Right. Um, these meteorites are highly magnetized and they behave just like little tiny compass needles in the, not in the wind, but in the interstellar medium. Mm. And so we found a uh, very sensitive detection of that signal, but we imputed it originally to the origin of the universe. So I'm very, uh, I'm very aware and very concerned about scientists, 
you know, wanting to prove things or attempting to prove things just because I think it could lead to a danger of what's called confirmation bias. Yeah. So yep. for me, I find them fascinating. It's hard to keep up with them. There are so many, as you said, Wolf from I've had on Weinstein, I've had on uh, Julian Barber's coming on. I've had on Loop Quantum Gravity expert Lee Smolin and uh, from the Perimeter Institute and Carlo Rovelli. I've had on Walden Maldacena, string theorist, Kamran Vafa. String. So I've had on all these people. I'm not dropping names. I'm just saying I get both signs because just like the military does, they form what are called red teams, right? So they have a red team approach where two, the best two different si uh, uh, you know, people, proponents of two diametrically opposed sides will come to debate, hopefully out of love and, and, and true understanding, seeking truth. Uh, they'll come together, not adversarial combativeness. But in getting both sides, I feel like I can get to a closer kernel of truth. And uh, and so that's where I'm focused on not having a predisposition, a predilection for one theory of everything over the other. But first, just trying to understand what are the consequences and how can I contribute into the observation or refutation of these right. claims? Yeah. You know, Wolfram has things that he predicts that are concrete and, and refutable, maybe not with technology we have now. Weinstein has more theoretical kind of constructs and interpretations, why we have certain generations of, of particles, why we have dark matter. Right. Um, and, and these are harder things to observe, at least at present, but that shouldn't stop experimentalists like me and those that I inspire from trying to conceive of ways to rule out and winnow out the different competing theories of everything. Right. And then with, with string theory, of course, we just, you know, it's all fine and dandy to say, well, these uh, vibrating strings, it's possible that they exist. Uh, but but until we have a way to measure and detect and, and take a look to see if they're actually there, uh, we don't really have any, uh, like you said, it's a, it's a, it's a really uh, spruced up, uh, nice looking um, uh, equation, but we, we actually need to, to, to verify that this exists in reality and not just as a concept, right? Um, yeah. So, I mean, when we think about what is testable and what does it mean um, to have a uh, to have a theory of everything and then uh, are these things testable? Let me take a step back and and, and I'll mention that I think it's it's mandatory that a, uh, that a theory of everything immediately be falsifiable. And I'll give you an example. Yeah. Uh, so um, so James Clerk Maxwell, he conceived of the Maxwell equations that describe electricity magnetism and unify them together in a single force field called electromagnetism, where there are two sides of one fundamental force that manifest themselves sometimes as little tiny magnets like these meteorites and magnets here, and sometimes in electromagnetic waves like the light in this room or or electricity in a battery. There's seem very different, right? The behavior of a needle of a compass can be influenced by a current flowing through a wire, and he had to explain why that was. Hmm. Um, but he also craved, as many did in the 1800s and 1700s, a mechanistic explanation, an explanation for how the force is conveyed. Because like Newton, when he talked about the law of universal gravitation, what does that mean? That means the apple that hit him on the head, uh, that same apple was pulled by that same force that is pulling the moon to orbit around the earth. And if the apple was where the moon was moving at the moon's velocity, he rationalized that it would have the same uh, orbital geometry and path as the moon. So that was a universal law. Now he wanted to think about that in terms of action at a, di like how do you actually, how is it pulling on it? And he didn't really speculate on how that could occur. Mm. Um, and, uh, and so that was left for later generations to kind of work on. But Maxwell did speculate, what is the force that supports the waves of electromagnetism? Well, he reasoned it must be something just like the waves of water support the electromag uh, the waves of water supported by the medium of water and there must be some medium and inside the medium there's little tiny mechanical gears and rotors and vortices and all sorts of things so in some of his diagrams he has the equations are completely correct and the model is completely laughable that there's these little gears in space that we can't see invisible gears sounds a lot like you know string theory uh, on steroids right but so imagine if like twitter existed back then Imagine if YouTube <laughs> like, people, oh, here's this guy and he's right. And then he, but he's saying this crazy idea of yeah. them, of his conjecture for it. So could we be in that same position with string theory, with geometric unity, with um, Wolfram's theory? Yes. So be careful in trying to rule out, you know, a philosophy, look more at testing the ideas and mm -hmm. not attacking the person. hundred percent. I couldn't agree more on that point. Uh, will we find a uh, particulate representation of gravity? 
uh, of gravity. So the hypothetical particle that mediates and modulates gravity is known and you know, has a name, but the graviton. Has <laughs> yeah, the graviton. So just because you know the name of something doesn't necessarily mean that you understand what it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, and for my perspective, the you know the the mere existence of the name is 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 interesting. But uh, but nevertheless, I think we we have it uh, postulated in that way for good reason, because all the forces that we seem to observe from the nuclear force to the um, to the uh, electromagnetic force um, are modulated and mediated for those three forces by what are called these these bosons, these gauge bosons mm -hmm. that are the force ca carriers. And so um, for some of them, they're massive and some of them they're not. Um, but, uh, but in the context of electricity and magnetism, we have the photon and that has zero mass. And that means it can travel at the speed of light. We know that there are waves of gravity, um, that have been detected by LIGO. And I've had on, uh, two of the three, um, Nobel, uh, prize winners for the LIGO discovery, uh, Barry Barish and Ray Weiss. And uh, we talked a lot about Einstein in those interviews as well as he's the one that conjectured the existence of gravitational waves, never thinking they'd be detected. So you have a whole other type of theorist, you know, who would say things that were totally right um, on one hand and totally wrong when forecasting the experimental capabilities of colleagues of mine later, 100 years later. So never be too pessimistic. That's another lesson. So we shouldn't be too pessimistic about these theories of everything either. Um, but getting back to gravity. So why do you expect that? Well, Electromagnetism, the laws of Maxwell, as I say, um, they don't have a um, you know microscopic gears. Instead, they are instantiations of electromagnetic waves, and those waves are known are classical waves. In other words, they have a they have a frequency and a period and a wavelength. Um, when we measure low frequency versions of them, namely when we measure uh, light waves, which are cons considerably low wa wavelength, you can interfere them, you can diffract them, you can see oil, you know, kind of rainbows and so forth. Those are all manifestations of the wave-like nature of light. On the other hand, if you crank up the energy really high, it becomes particular. It becomes like a particle. So you can count individual photons and actually your eye in an ultra dark room, they've studied in, in nature, I read a study, you can detect as, as few as one or two photons mm -hmm. of the right energy hitting your retina can be detectable. It's just fascinating. So, yeah. uh, part, so your eye can be a particle detector of individual particles. Now, that's in the quantum regime. When you're talking about the quantum nature of the photon, which was a classical wave in ordinary experience, it has a quantum analog. We have now established firmly, definitively, directly that gravity has waves, classical waves, travel at the speed of light, endure forever, have infinite lifetimes, and uh, can penetrate all matter and uh, space. Uh, and so they behave exactly as Einstein would predict. Now, let's say what, as we do with uh, electromagnetism, Richard Feynman, Schwinger, and Tamanga, let's quantize it. Let's make it a quantum theory of gravity. And that, so far, has been resistant. We're not able to actually... Uh, rectify the the uh, properties of gravity with quantum mechanics using ordinary quantum mechanical techniques of you know just ordinary right. uh, the analog of QED but for gravity can't be done so that's why um, uh, theories of everything have started to percolate and I actually don't like that name theory it's not a theory of everything uh, yeah I, I agree <laughs> you know, Travis is gonna wear a shirt with like a blue and a red thing I mean maybe you wear that every day it's not gonna tell you that or what the lottery is it's gonna tell you how uh, does gravity interact with um yeah. with with uh, matter at a quantum level but i always point out um you know that's called a theory of everything or toe or toe um we're also still looking for what's called a gut which is a grand unified theory and so we still put the toe before the gut and it's it's kind of unusual no one ever writes me and says you know Ludwig Boltzmann was wrong, you know, but they always say Einstein was wrong or Brian right. Green is wrong or whatever. Right. And so that's part of the challenge of being an experimentalist. Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, well, you would think like where where there are waves, if you if you had uh, where there are gravitational waves, if you had the instruments, you would think uh, th there would be some kind of particulate representation at some level. But is it is it, you know, maybe we don't have the instruments to to detect that at this time. And, and is that why we kind of put the placeholder of uh, hypothetical graviton in that place? Yeah, well, I mean, the graviton is well motivated if if you expect that that gravity can be quantized. Right. My question is that um, we know that the quantization of of electromagnetism plays a role in 
this communication device, you know, CCD cameras and transistors and the quantum nature of, of, of electromagnetism is important for all of modern society. Um, on the other hand, quantum gravity, not, I don't just mean it won't be relevant to you in your daily life, you know, uh, uh, and, and your, you know, your job or something like that. Cause I don't even think quantum, you know, the Higgs boson, you know, has been detected. That doesn't impact people's daily life. Does it? Right. If it does, I've got some good psychotherapists I can recommend. <laughs> uh, but, um, but I'm feeling the, the Higgs field. <laughs> the Higgs made me do it. One of my kids tells me that. <laughs> He beats That's up good. his younger brother. Uh, but getting back to, you know, why, now, where is gravity need to be quantized? Often it's tautological. The saying is we need gravity, uh, a quantum theory of gravity to understand what happens at a singularity. Mm -hmm. Well, where are singularities? Well, singularities take place potentially in the Big Bang, uh, in, the, in the singularity theorems of Penrose, who's been a guest on my show, and Stephen Hawking, the late, great Stephen Hawking. Um, and they also play a role also in Penrose's work and, and the uh, core of black holes. So um, and then I say, well, you know, we can't access either one of those. I asked Sir Roger Penrose, you know, we can't go back to the Big Bang. We can't take data from it. We can't replicate it. Um, and in a black hole, once you get beyond the event horizon, it's a one way trip to the future that all leads to the singularity. So in what sense are, is it real, testable or is it pure, you know, hypothetical conjecture? And I think that's still a question I'm waiting to get answered. Right. You know, do we have, will we be able to do the analog of the double slit experiment with gravity? Can we do, you know, can we demonstrate gravitons? Because um, we can't generate them. Even, even two enormous 30 times the mass of the sun black holes crashing together at the speed of light um, a billion light years away, they only cause, you know, the shift in, in space time by a you know, billionth of the diameter of a proton. Right. So, I mean, imagine, and that that's like trillions of these gravitons if, if they are gravitons. Right. So, you know, making single gravitons interfere with one another, like we do with photons, it sounds, it sounds highly implausible. So there, the question is, can we get the low energy regime? So imagine you're trying to understand, um, you know, quantum mechanics. So Richard Feynman, one of his lesser known books, but it was actually the first book of his I ever read, is called QED, A Strange Theory of Light and Matter. And he talks about visualizing the behavior of photons in their quantum um, nature. And it's a popular science book. I recommend it very highly. Um, and it talks about visualizing them as sort of an amplitude and, and a phase. And most people are familiar with amplitude, like how bright something is, but phase is kind of uh, nebulous. So he talks about like each photon carries a little clock and the clock is winding around and he's a master storyteller. Mm. And then, and he says, as these photons come in and reflect, one reflects off the surface of an oil puddle on top of a, uh, a water puddle or an oil drop on top of a oil uh, of, of a water puddle, <laughs> um, that uh, it will travel less distance through less of a medium than the one that reflects off the bottom surface of the oil and goes out and reflects to the eye. So you'll see this rainbow pattern and he explains it in terms of this phase lag due to these clocks ticking away as the photons travel. And it's just a brilliant analog. And it tells me that you can think of what are called low dimensional or low energy uh, versions of a quantum theory that you can then test. So my question is, are there sets of data out there that we have right now that we could test for the existence of gravitons or quantum gravity with in the so-called low energy regime, not going back to the big bang at 10 to the 12th GeV energy scales go going right now with the analog of a, of a, of an oil puddle. <laughs> um, right. What are those types of experiments? I'm confident that there are some and, and it should be very interesting to think about what they, what they can tell us. Mm. Okay. So uh, one more question on physics and then I want to get to God. Um, what, uh, what is the best hypothesis for dark energy? I mean, it's mostly dark energy around us. What is it? So we look out in the universe and we see the universe has certain properties. Those properties have to do with its large scale structure. In other words, what are its properties on its largest possible observable scales, both in space and in time? It also has properties on smaller scales, small being the size of a galaxy or cluster of galaxies, not very small. <laughs> um, and those properties all trace to um, the fundamental parameters of our standard cosmological model, which is um, essentially governed by, by Einstein's theory of general relativity. The laws of general relativity tell us about the large scale structure of space and time, but they also tell us about the small scale warping of space time due to gravitational effects and matter. 
And what uh, what's so fascinating is that just a handful of parameters are needed to describe everything that we see around us on the largest and the smallest scales. Um, so we can describe things. We have a map of the universe, literally. I mean, there's one above my head over here, right? So there's a beach ball behind me up there. And it has a map of what you'd see if you could look out with microwave vision of every structure that emits significant amounts of microwaves. Um, and those trace their origin to the or origin of the universe and perhaps even beyond, you know, what we call the Big Bang era, the nucleosynthesis era, which traces back to perhaps this inflationary era that my colleagues and I were looking for and are looking for to this very day. So the question becomes, why is the universe have the properties that it does have? And this will dovetail into God, because in many conceptions, we don't have a good reason why the parameters are actually uh, fit for us to exist, why we can have stable galaxies, why we can have a, um, a, a planetary uh, formation, a star formation, why stars last long enough for us to develop complex technological uh, life forms. <laughs> so for all these reasons, we, um, we seek an explanation. A dark energy seems to be the force that is responsible for the continued expansion of our universe at an ever-increasing rate. So when we look out, we see galaxies, and those galaxies are made of stars, and we can use individual stars within the galaxies as little speedometers. And we can look at the speedometer, and as we go back in time, we see the speedometers were going slower. In other words, the galaxies were expanding away from us still, um, and they still are, but they were expanding away from us at a slower rate, and now they're expanding faster. So if tomorrow they were uh, 100 uh, uh, expanding at 100 kilometers per second away from us, uh, the next day after that, they'll be expanding 101 kilometers per second. So they're accelerating. So actually the velocity is increasing. The expansion is occurring and the expansion is getting faster. Yeah. So it's uh, it's it's um, and the explanation of it uh, what the, the is, is is still lacking. We don't have a good theory for why that's occurring. Mm. We have observations of it as we do for dark matter. We have copious amounts of evidence for dark matter. And yet we don't know what it is, even though it outnumbers the stuff that we're made of protons, neutrons, croutons. I had <laughs> salad recently. Um, you know, because we don't have a good theory for the matter that outnumbers our matter by a factor of five to 10. Yeah. Um, the most of the matter in the universe uh, that's ordinary is hydrogen and helium. Then there's a little tiny bit, less than 1% of the matter energy density in our universe is carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus. And all these. it's just astounding to think about the 1% of the half a percent of the universe that is us is really, you know, able to comprehend itself. Right. So that's really fascinating. But the dominant thing is this dark energy, which is kind of almost completely unknown. And because it's completely unknown, physicists feel free to speculate on its properties and what it can do for us to kind of bolster our confidence in the scientific method mm -hmm. and or compromise our, our best you know, models that we conjecture to this very day. One more follow up question to that. If, if this is, in fact, a force, dark energy, um, and, and we were to put it on the, the scale of... Uh, you know, gravity, uh, weak and strong, electromagnetism, the forces that we have, uh, you know, the particulate representations of. Um, do, do you think uh, dark energy is a very weak force or a very strong force? It's um, it's very weak in the sense that it, um, you know, it doesn't manifest itself on any scale in our solar system, galaxy, cluster of galaxies. It's really not until you get way, way beyond the scale of our local galactic neighborhood does it become pertinent to our observations at all. And yet uh, it acts as sort of an anti-gravitational force. Hmm. Causing the universe to inflate requires the presence of like it would be a tantamount to like a negative mass or anti-gravity. So instead of two objects pulling together more strongly, the more massive they are, it's they start to push apart and they go apart like tension uh, stretching a spring. So that for that reason, it can't be too strong or we wouldn't be here. Right. Uh, <laughs> and it may have existed early on in the universe. And, and that, uh, expansion could have actually caused the initial origin of our universe to begin with expansion. Cause there's mm. multiple possibilities, but it's fascinating that we live during an era when the universe has just the right parameters, processes, and, um, and, and, um, forces for us to be able to be existing. And of course people say, well, 
if it didn't, we wouldn't be here asking about its properties because we wouldn't be able to exist. So mm. you get all these kind of um, anthro anthropic arguments that that people use, and one of which is that uh, you know prediction that dark energy should exist because otherwise the universe's properties would have looked very different and been incompatible for us to exist. But mm. it must be weak. To answer your question, it must be weak. Mm. Interesting. Okay, well, let's move on to God for a moment here. I have a quote here. As a youth, Brian Keating was a member of the Catholic Church. As an adult, he gradually found his way into the Jewish faith. Um, well, why don't you why don't you talk about that uh, that transition? What how did that transition come about? So, um, around, both my parents were born uh, Jewish, and in Judaism, it's not as it is in Christianity, where uh, it's an affirmative religion where you uh, actively profess a belief in Jesus Christ. In Judaism, it's it's as much cultural, ethnic, and by birth. And so um, even though I converted to become Catholic as a young person after my parents uh, and my mother remarried an Irish Catholic man named Ray Keating, um, after that time, I was uh, I, I was confirmed. And so far, he was still I'm still considered Jewish. In other words, you can't leave Judaism mm. because it doesn't it's 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 um, it passes on through your biological parents or you can convert into Judaism. And even if you convert into Judaism and then you leave it, you're still considered Jewish. So it's kind of interesting. But um, in my case, when I was um, when I was converted and I became very interested in uh, in serving God and learning more about God, I was very close um, uh, to this uh, this pastor, this Monsignor priest. Um, Robert Skelly, and he was, uh, you know, a mentor, kind of, uh, you know, just incredibly humorous, um, loved to uh, loved to be philosophical. And I love the feeling, you know, of, of well, maybe I could, you know, this is kind of a lifestyle I could do. Maybe I could become a priest. And that was at age 12. And then I don't know if it was this like this for you, but around age 13, I discovered uh, girls were pretty interesting and <laughs> I wanted to learn more about them. And and then I started to ask, you know, the Monsignor, I would say, you know, how does it, how do you deal with it? You know, this vow of celibacy. And, and so, right. and I realized that probably wasn't, you know, the job description that I wanted to have at least, you know, when I was 13 and around that same time, you'll remember, I discovered my, my, uh, my first telescope yeah. and was peering up at the heavens and unknowingly reproducing the observations of Galileo. And so, you know, it's interesting, Travis, and the reason I, I keep pressing people in the chat to get a telescope for their kids and even for themselves, because, you know about the Higgs boson, you, you know, but but um, you can never feel what it felt to discover the Higgs boson. You'll never. I, I'll just make that statement. You'll never feel what it felt for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of which is you don't have the ability to build your own Large Hadron Collider by yourself, and you can't analyze the data by yourself. And and you need you don't have the resources. It's I mean, go back to anything, almost any particle physics experiment. Uh, the discovery of DNA's double helix structure that took, you know, 10 people uh, plus, you know, electron micro crystallography and um, Rosalind Franklin's enormous contributions, et cetera. Um, so you can't do that. But what you can do is feel and think about this, Travis, you can have the exact same emotional, visceral feeling that Galileo had the first time you look at Saturn through a telescope. The first time you look at the moon, you could do that every month of the year of your life. You can see the moon. So you can have the exact same feeling. He was like, holy cow, I see mountains on the moon. I see craters. I see lava flows. I see flat plains. I see, I see all this incredible things that are forbidden in my conception. When I just, even when I just look up at it, I can't see a mountain. I can't see a lava tube. <laughs> no, you can feel what Galileo felt when he discovered something scientifically 411 years ago. Mm. So I want to ask you, you know, to think about that. What other experiences can you have in science where you replicate not only the discovery, but you replicate the emotional visceral connection. That's mm. why it's so powerful. Yeah. So I became transfixed by astronomy. I learned as much as I could. I became passionately curious. Again, my motto on my channel, always be curious, ABC. And that took me to learn more about mathematics, et cetera. And it also took me to learn more about Galileo. And at that time, uh, in 1986 or so, uh, Galileo had not been pardoned by the Catholic Church for the heretical statement uh, that he was suspected of holding that the earth went around the sun. Now, the reason why this is held heretical, we can get into, and that she was not imprisoned 
and um, he was not tortured uh, for science and his beliefs. That's a fallacy that people put forth to sell books. Um, actually, I hosted a party in a seminar a conference in his prison, quote unquote, which is a sumptuous villa overlooking mm -hmm. the Duomo in Florence, Italy. Uh, and I don't think too many conferences in physics are held in prison. So anyway, <laughs> he was a uh, and he was also a devout you know, believer in God, as were you know basically all of his contemporaries. But his um, but his treatment by the church was well known at the time as when I was 13 years old and I became very disillusioned. In fact, he was never pardoned by the Catholic Church, even to this day. Uh, in 1992, Pope John Paul II, who's a, an, an incredible human being, he um, he made uh, an, a proclamation that Galileo was correct, but it was never formally repealed this, uh, this the, the way that he was treated. Again, he wasn't tortured, but he was forced to recant under penalty of torture. In other words, they said, if you don't do this, we'll torture you. And then he recanted it. And so he wasn't tortured. Not great. I'm not defending them. Right. And in fact, that was the thing that drove me away from Catholicism. And I started to think, mm. well, you know, if they're willing to treat people for believing in things, uh, for thought crimes, for heresy, um, you know, that just didn't seem compatible with my burgeoning interest in women and <laughs> and my burgeoning interest in science. And so it was kind of maybe not the most sophisticated way of looking at it. Uh, but I also was able to say, well, you know, if Catholicism is wrong, then um, Catholicism came after and Christianity came after Judaism. So they must have improved upon all the lacunae and flaws in Judaism. And because of that, and the fact that if you can reject B, then you can reject A if A then B, you know, modus tollens. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, I felt economical. I said, I don't have to believe in anything. I don't have to believe in in the religion that I'm practicing and keep, you know, this 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 um, kind of practice up that would lead me down potentially becoming a priest, which I didn't want to do anyway um, at the time, even though I love the, you know, the camaraderie and the, and I had a wonderful time. But um, but also I could reject Judy. So, I was, you know, unfor you know, getting rid of two theologies with one stone, with one telescopic glass. And so their thing stood in college, I think, is not uncommon for people to be um, to be atheist in their inclination. And it was really uh, the way that things stood until I again started to replicate Galileo's and I'm not comparing myself to Galileo, but um, but I be, again began to think about ways we could look for the biggest answers to questions in the universe via a refracting telescope not unlike the one that he developed. And that one is called bicep and it's the telescope, you know, kind of behind me over here. Right. And, and that, uh, that's the subject, you know, the star of the book. And because of that, I started to think more about things. Well, what did I really know? You know, most Travis, most Jewish men that leave the religion I've had on, you know, many people, including Jewish men and women, uh, like Andrewian, who is the widow of, of Carl Sagan, who was also atheist, um, I've had on many, many people, uh, I'm having Lawrence Krauss on soon on the podcast. Great. Yeah. And, yeah. And this, um, you know, the notion is that once you become 13 years old, you know, everything. So, so therefore, if you can reject it, you're rejecting it for the rest of your life, but it's a 13 year old's understanding of a topic that's allowing you to reject it. And, uh, and so because of that, I think they would never accept a refutation of their own cosmological model, you know, see Lawrence believes in inflation and the multiverse, but if a 12 year old came up or a 13 year old, i.e. him at his age refuting uh, Judaism, if a 13 year old says, Lawrence, I'm gonna prove to you that the multiverse is BS and there is no such thing as inflation and here's this alternative. And he would say, you're completely wrong, uh, except if they, you know, could, uh, he would be likely to say that you're wrong uh, and and if the if the person's just just bringing up based on anecdotal evidence, which is all you can do from religion, you can't prove it, you can't disprove it um, uh, using facts or evidence. Um, and that's why we have a concept of faith. So the question is, do scientists have as much faith as religious practitioners? I, I think their can, argument can be made that they do. And so I started to wonder, how much do I really know about Judaism if I abandon it at age seven and then abandon all religion at age 13? Um, and, uh, and, um, and so I started to think more, more critically, you know, mm -hmm. I, I examined my own motivations. Why am I not doing this? Uh, why am I not practicing re the religion of my birth? What do I know about? It? And then all of a sudden September 11th came along 
and I actually got reunited with my father. And a lot of the, you know, kind of um, knowledge of science really doesn't tell you anything about wisdom. I have a video on my channel called Knowledge Isn't Equal to Wisdom. Does not equal wisdom. And I start to think, which is more important, knowledge or wisdom? And uh, it became something that I, I wanted to learn about because the word Torah, which is the name for the Bible, the Old Testament in Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament, means wisdom or teacher. Hmm. It doesn't mean uh, knowledge. Science means knowledge in Latin. So we have to look at these things. What are their uh, what are their realms, as Stephen Jay Gould said, of magisteria, which I don't really, it's just a big word that basically means what are the domains of expertise. Um, and they might have something to do with each other, but they might not. And so let's take a candid examination of it. And uh, and so I started to question my own motivations for the first time. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, well, there's a, there's a lot to talk about there. Uh, you mentioned uh, scientists and faith. Um, so what, 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 are, what are the things that a scientist would do that you would consider to be in the realm of faith? Um, well, I think that scientists practice, um, scientists, when they believe things um, that aren't either are not disprovable or not falsifiable, or if they have a predisposition to something that comports with their own origin story um, preference, those raise questions. I'm not going to say they're religious, although I will say in the video that I'm talking about the faith of a physicist, I talk about um, I talk about uh, Andre Linde and other um, and other people who, who are the foremost advocates for the multiverse interpretation of the anthropic you know principle and why we have constants tuned for our existence. And literally the article talks about his faith in the multiverse. I think that's odd. Like you wouldn't say I have faith in quantum electrodynamics. No, you'd say we have evidence for, I have faith in evolution. No, 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 no. We have no faith in evolution. Mm. We have evidence for evolution. Yeah. Repl repun uh, re or, you know, resplendent. I mean, I would say evolu evolution, uh, I mean, evolution is a fact. And then we, we build evolutionary theory by natural selection uh, based on those facts that we ob observe, right? Yeah. Um, now, people conflate fact with perfect. In other words, that right. the earth is a sphere is much more accurate than the earth is flat. Um, however, it's actually wrong, right? The earth is not a sphere at all. It has significant uh, spherical distortions, spherical harmonic content that's non-zero. Uh, um, now, uh, so if you say that the earth is a sphere, are you as wrong as if you say it's flat, according to Isaac Asimov? Uh, no, you're much more close to the truth. Right. But science being provisional doesn't mean that you don't have any trust in science. That's ridiculous. Yeah. And I think when people say sphere, I think they're speaking colloquially as a sure. sphere, uh, you know, and, you know, colloquial... Uh, uh, generalizations of geometric objects. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so uh, now when someone like Brian Greene says, uh, uh, talks about multiverse and says, well, you know, we expect that there could be, you know, a multiverse out there. I think that's different than someone with a religious faith who will say, you know, I'm going to believe that this is the case. You know, and I'm and for the reason I give or, or the reason I will give is faith. Um, and when I when I hear something like that, and and I'll be interested to hear what your definition of faith is, because uh, my my working definition is uh, faith is an excuse you give for believing something when you have go, no good reason to give. Because if you had a good reason to give, like if I ask you why do you believe you know, electromagnetism is a force, you would give your good reasons, right? And when I say good, I would say uh, rational reasons or your logical reasons as to why you believe. Um, but if someone says, you know, I just have faith that a God exists, um, I, I, I try to say, well, are, do you have any good reasons or do you just have this idea of faith, which I think is the absence of good reason. Well, let me ask you a question. Is uh, what's an example of of evidence? Uh, if I say I had a personal encounter, as some of my Christian friends do, mm -hmm. uh, with Jesus Christ, that He saved my life, and I've had people tell me that. Mm -hmm. um, is that does that count to you as a quote? Well, you said a reason. I'm going to call reason evidence. Is that evidence? Um, so it, I think someone could cite it as evidence, like it, you know, just like if we were uh, in, let's say, if we were in the court of law. 
and and someone's eyewitness testimony was considered uh, as evidence for the entire case. I would say one could consider it as evidence, uh, which is why I'm I'm usually interested in proof positive for claims. So if someone says I had an experience with Jesus Christ, therefore I am willing to claim, uh, you know, that a God exists, and this is my proof for that. I would say that is not proof. For that positive claim because we can think of all of the uh it, you know we throw occam's razor at that it's much more likely that they were you know uh just imagining this experience with with christ right yeah well right so i mean we do count people say oh that's just eyewitness well we take eyewitness evidence in certain cases as as definitive um obviously we like to have more robust non um yeah. modified but you know of course we can modify videos we can modify audio and even when you have video and even when you have audio, my friend Avi Loeb was on the podcast and he talks about, well, you know, if God really wanted us to believe in him, you know, when when Abraham was asked to sacrifice Isaac, um, he would have given him a cell phone camera and said, look, just record it and then we'll all believe it. And I, I just think, you know, I love Avi. He's the former chair of the Harvard astronomy department for the longest serving time in, in history. And I think that's, that's ludicrous. I think, you know, the next day we'd say, Oh, well, no, that's Adobe after effects. Well, yeah. And, yeah. Okay. I, I think that, I think that would be uh, insufficient to the, uh, the magnitude of, of what claim is being made. Like, and, and it's a good question. I, I often get asked, well, what would it take? Like what proof do we need? Well, I'm not the one that is presenting you know, an all powerful, uh, creator, whatever attribute someone is, is, uh, attaching to it. I, I don't necessarily know what it would take to demonstrate something like that. And I'm, and I'm speaking now uh, going away from the court analogy into yeah. the, uh, into the realm of science. Like if we, if some, uh, to me, if someone makes an is claim, for instance, if someone say there are vibrating strings, uh, you know, at this certain mm -hmm. level that we will find eventually, you know, I, I say, well, where's your proof positive for this? And someone else will show me string theory and I'll be like, well, that's a that's a cool hypothesis. But I, I mean, you haven't de even demonstrated that the damn strings uh, actually exist in reality. And I think that's where the scientific method comes into contact with string theory. So if someone is claiming something exists or something is, I look to the scientific method to see what the, what we would have to say about that uh, on that side. And, and I think um, if we don't have, uh, you know, I don't see any proof positive for the existence of any gods. Uh, and I think that's where the term faith comes in, where people, people will say, well, I just feel as though this is the case, uh, you know, emotionally or from a, what I would call a pleasure drive perspective. You know, I, I, I feel this uh, belief to be pleasurable. And, and so I believe it. Um, but, but uh, you know, I just, I don't, I haven't been, and this is why I hold the atheist position, which, which I'll, I'll give you my definition, or, or I'll give you an example. Like, people have been coming up to me my whole life talking to me about gods and how gods exist from all different parts of the world. And then uh, I get to the point where, I, where I'm like, okay, what are, what are the proof positives for, for this claim that I, can, uh, that I can start looking at and we can start talking about? It? And I've never seen proof positive at all. Uh, I've seen I've seen people present things as evidence, like holy books, uh, personal experience, and I, and I and I throw Occam's razor at the problem, and I say, well, you know, you likely dreamt this, or you you know, you like it, you know, it's possible that this is all true. It's possible that there is, you know, a J Judeo uh, Christian God. Uh, it's possible. I'm, I and it's and it's also possible that you know Elvis Presley is living on Mars. But I want to, yeah, yeah. Which but I, believe, right? <laughs> some people believe. But I, I want to get to uh, a point. I think people should believe as many true things and as few false things as possible. And how do we? D and then we get get yeah. into epistemology. How do we determine that truth part of the uh, epistemological triangle? Yeah. So I'm happy to talk about this. Um, first thing I would say is uh, I don't think it's possible to prove this. I don't think it's possible to prove the existence of God even from just a uh, the, the subjective um, perspective of if it were possible, um, there's two pro there's two choices. It would he would already be proven or he would already be falsified. And in which case you would get if you're faithful, you'd get absolutely no credit for believing and you'd right. get absolutely no credit if you don't believe like you do, because you're just assessing evidence and applying a Bayesian prior to this different form of evidence, assessing cred uh, credulity as you go along. 
That's totally consistent. You're being self-consistent. However, um, I also don't think that people exist without religion. I think everybody has a religion. I think I've talked to atheists many times and many of them are like Phil Zuckerman, who you might know, and uh, he's a professor. I haven't talked to him, but he's, he's at Pomona College or one of the colleges mm. out at Claremont College. He writes books about the secular life, why it's so great to be secular. And he talks about all these alternatives, which I've spoken at. I spoke at a humanist, uh, ethical humanist uh, society of Chicago, oldest one in existence in the country. I speak at these Sunday assemblies all the time. These are atheist assemblies. So what are they doing? They're mimicking the beneficial aspects of religion where they have services, they have hymnals, they have food, they do charity works of kindness, mitzvot, as we say. They do all these things, but there's not a theological overlay. It's a humanistic um, overlay on top of it. Yeah, I think you're talking love- about secular humanism as a, as, a, as a movement, but I see that different than atheism because I don't engage in any any of those religious things that uh, that you talk about but i understand I, I know what you're talking about there are atheists who are part of the quote unquote religion of secular humanism a lot of them wouldn't call it that because uh colloquially we understand religions to be connected to gods right um and and one might say well the the human is the god in the in the or or let's say uh uh well-being or or biological flourishment is the god of of um but but isn't that just uh make it, uh pulverizing what religion uh why the term was created um and and you know, and and I guess uh, one thing I'd be interested in is to maybe go through and see if I I I would say look maybe maybe an example of me being religious would be how I look at uh, my favorite hockey team, the Vancouver Canucks, who don't have a chance in hell at making the playoffs almost every year in the past four Keep years. Faith. But I'm still keeping the faith, and I'm like, you know what, guys, we got this new young guy, and I just feel it. Okay, I feel it, and maybe that's where I'm I'm the most religious in my life. But I, I recognize that I am being uh, irrational, you know, yeah. in, in those. You're being in, tribal. You're, I you're am being tri- I'm way. not. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not looking over at other teams in the league and being like, OK, they have four lines. Their four lines or their fourth line is better than our first line. Like I and I understand that. And I understand I'm engaging in fantasy like I'm LARPing. Um, yeah. But uh, but I, I I can still enjoy that which I think some people kind of do with religiosity and with course, belief Travis, in God. hundred you know? percent. You're, I, I, I don't begrudge you that I do that too, for the even worse chance. Uh, at least the Canucks have won like the Stanley cup, right? No, uh, we've never, never won. The Are you serious? Cup. Oh man. Well, has any Vancouver team won anything? And because San Diego has never had a championship in any professional sport. And I keep the faith even as a yeah, native yeah. New Yorker, I do, but let me just say this. Yeah. You're talking about like tribal identity, which I think is a big part, a big aspect of religion. As I said, you can social apes too, right? Yeah. I mean, we can actually start off, you know, you and I, I can take someone, you know, uh, who is, uh, you know, a Coptic Christian in, in Egypt. And I can have the, I can believe and be a member of the same tribe as him. If I just accept Jesus Christ as my personal saint, right? That's a tenet of of Christianity. I happen to not, you know, follow that tenet. And you might say, well, why do you reject, you know, Jesus? And and you could, you could argue that. And actually I have a lot of issues because I I do debate with, um, with uh, theologians and intelligent designers and even uh, Christian apologists, uh, uh, Stephen Meyer. So on my channel, he and I debate uh, with Justin, um, on, uh, on his channel, Unbelievable. And so we get into these topics. Uh, and I always have a problem because uh, with with uh, hardcore Catholic uh, Christians like William Lane Craig, who will say things like everything that began had a beginner. I don't think he's laughable, Travis. I, I don't I don't I, mock him. I, I, well, my, look, the reason why I laugh is because the guy, it, it's hard to get him off his script. And I, oh, and, and I, I and I, I make the, and I make the same claim about someone like Michio Kaku. I try yeah. my damnedest in a podcast with Dr. Kaku to get him off of his, the yeah. script I've been hearing for, yeah. for years. And I was just like, can I get something new? And the I ended up, I ended up getting a little new anecdote when I asked what him about it? what his daughter, uh, uh, she, she, his daughter talked about him in an article and I brought up a quote from his daughter and it was cool hearing him talk about fatherhood, but oh, that's uh, nice. Yeah. yeah. I, know, I got him to yell about, uh, alternatives to con- to string theory. Oh, okay. And yeah, I got him to also say, you know, that, that, uh, you know, there is no one string theory. So you have an infinite number of possibilities, but it actually connects right. to what I'm doing. So Travis, so what I call myself a devout agnostic. 
And I had this conversation with a, one of the most famous agnostics in history, which is Freeman Dyson. He was the first guest on my podcast. And I, I love him and I miss him. Um, Freeman said, I'm an agnostic. And I said, oh, that's great, Freeman. Um, so does that mean like you're a Schrodinger's cat, like you're half not believing and half believing? Let me ask you a question, Freeman Dyson. How would an intelligent alien, if they exist, which is another form perhaps we can get into of tribal identity and religious overtones that we should talk about? Because actually 40% of, of human, of American population believes we should spend money from the taxpayer money and probably the same in Canada to investigate these phenomena. And yet if you ask them, well, should we investigate these sightings of God or Jesus? They would say, hell no, separation of church and state. Mm. But anyway, let's, let's get off that for a second. Yeah. But let me get back to Freeman Dyson. I said, Freeman, my, 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 my mentor, my, my father figure, how could an alien looking at you and knowing about our culture and our tribal, tribal identity, how could he distinguish you who doesn't go to church, who doesn't do anything religious, but calls himself an agnostic? How are you functionally different from Richard Dawkins? Because you both don't go to the same church. And he was like, well, I don't really know. And I don't want to like press him too much on it because I just have so much reverence for him. But the question is a good one. So what does it mean to be an agnostic? To me, uh, an atheist means you actively affirm the non-existence of God. Uh, agnostic means it's not knowable, uh, whether that's the term, the actual definition. Michael Shermer you know, and I discussed this on a podcast we did together. It's not knowable in principle if God can exist or not. But sometimes, Travis, that's a cop out. Sometimes my colleagues, and I don't know if Brian Green would say this either. You know, they might he might say he's agnostic. I think Michio Kaku does you know, kind of adhere to the agnostic line. But again, I keep saying, if you don't, agnosticism must be practiced, Travis. You can't be a passive agnostic because otherwise you're just not indistinct. You're indistinguishable from an atheist. You can't be confused with a theist, right? If you go to, if you go to church and you actively profess a belief in Jesus Christ, um, or you go to temple as I do, um, you actively profess connection to the, you know, the the triad of Judaism. We have a holy trinity too: God, Torah, and Israel, mm. just like uh, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. But if you don't do something active, performative, and behavioral, Travis, my claim is you're not agnostic. You're just an mm. atheist who refuses for one way or another, yeah. maybe out of fear, yeah. maybe out of cowardice, but you you just don't want to say it. So, so I'm going to say it. Yeah, yeah. Here is the confusion: Gnosticism and agnosticism deals with what we claim to know. It deals with knowledge and atheism and theism deals with what you claim to believe. So what Correct. you are convinced to believe. So when someone says, when someone's just afraid of the atheist label, like Neil deGrasse Tyson, because yes. uh, he doesn't want to be lumped in with the, you know, the, the, right. the neck beard edge Lords right. that live in their uh, mother's basement. He doesn't want to be, he doesn't want to be lumped in with that, that crowd. Um, he he's actually hasn't even done the basic reading on what these terms mean. So it's so right. when he's sitting there saying, well, I'm agnostic because I don't know if there are right. gods. Well, I'm not, not. going to tell you. He told yeah. me like on my show, like, I'm not going to tell you what to believe. Just don't teach, you know, dinosaurs where uh, Jesus Christ was riding. Right, right. I'm like, nobody says that. Like, I'm not talking about young earth. I'm talking about yeah, intelligent yeah. design is very different from young earth, by yeah, the way. Yeah. Intelligent design posits the reason for low entropy conditions and, and right. sort of the uh, information. Now, I'm not professing, obviously, yeah. a strict definition. But, but let me tell you something that I think is unique in my approach. Again, stemming not as a theorist like Brian or Neil or Lisa Randall or Jan Levin or, or, or Lenny Susskind or, who, or Stephen Hawking. All theorists. Don't you know? Isn't that suspicious that you get all your information about physics from theoretical physicists? You get nothing from experimental scientists, astrophysicists. I'm trying to bolster that as mm. a tool to communicate the passion of science because most kids will say, I'm not Einstein. Are you crazy? And then they don't go into it. And we lose right. out on it. People will see me and say, well, I can build stuff. I'm good at like playing with Raspberry Pi or coding or working on my car back when that was a thing you could actually do right. or, or whatever. Um, but let me tell you this. My book, and I, I hope you'll read it because I would love to get your take on it. It is about a wrestling with theology. And I took upon myself, Travis, uh, actual experimental um, uh, test. Can I falsify the Torah? I mean, I think that's a very interesting question. In other words, Definitely. the Torah makes certain claims. And I wondered if by adhering to those claims, uh, if I could falsify the Torah. And I'll give you two examples. And by the way, so I'm a behaviorist. I believe that I derive practical benefits the way that you do from going down to the bar and, and drinking and celebrating the Canucks. I have practical benefits. The wisdom, the tradition, the knowledge of literature, history, and culture, and connection to a people. Sense of um, community. That, 
Yeah. It's a community yeah. that has in its goal. Like Travis, I don't know. I mean, we're just meeting for the first time. I'm really enjoying this tremendously. I think you're brilliant at what you're doing. And I'm just in awe of how much growth you've had. I don't know. You might do this, um, but I'm forced to do this by my, by my commandments. I have to give 10% of my, my um, income to charity pre-tax. Mm. I have to do it. I don't want to do it. You know, anybody who wants to give away their money in addition to the tax, again, it's pre-tax. Um, I have to do things on a regular basis. I have to eat certain foods yeah. and, and I might say like, Oh, I don't even know if I believe in it. I'm still agnostic. So let me ask you this question. If it's not, if you don't care, you know what, whether God exists or not, it's actually not that, uh, it's not that interesting to me. It matters to me. I actually prefer atheist because, um, the word, I don't know if, if you know this, the word Israel, you've heard the word Israel in Hebrew. Do you know what it means in Hebrew? Uh, no. In Hebrew, if you translate, it means someone who fights with God. Mm. El is like Eloheinu. It means God. And Yisra means to wrestle or fight. And it's from uh, the passage where Jacob wrestles with an angel and he gets a new name. No longer shall you be called Jacob, Yaakov. You'll be called Israel. Fights because he fought with God. What the heck does that mean? Mm. Now, no. What does Islam mean? Do you know what the word Islam means in Arabic? Uh no, I don't. Isn't it similar? Or I no, I don't. It's, still, no, it's okay. the exact opposite. It oh, means okay. Submission. Oh, it's the opposite. Okay. It means submit to God. Oh, okay. So, submit. so that's a value in Islam. And I have you know many. And one of the great things about being a podcaster is you know you meet people from all around the world. One of my closest friends, who I've never met, I hope to meet her, Marwell Alduini. She's a devout practicing Muslim. You know, wears a hijab and everything. And we have wonderful talks about robotics and God. You know, it's, it's incredible what the internet can do. Just another plug for YouTube and podcasting, getting out there. But when you think about the difference, what does it mean to wrestle? It means that you're never without thinking about defending your position as you do, um, thinking about uh, going on offense, et cetera. So you know who is another uh, is Israelite in addition to you? With Stephen Hawking. Every single one of Stephen Hawking's popular books are about God in one way or another. The Grand Design is about string theory and M theory. Um, a Brief History of Time, his most popular book of all time, uh, was about the no boundary condition, which got rid of the initial uh, value problem that the universe had to be created and time instantiated. Every single one of his books, he was wrestling with God. And he would even say things like the end of his book is the title of Michio's book. The end of his book is the mind of God. And that's in the, you know, the God equation. We can know the mind of God. That's Michio's last line in his book too. If we get string theory right, we can know the mind of God. Why are these guys and women who are atheists, um, you know, self-proclaimed, why are they so saturated in God? I claim yeah. cool. they're wrestling with God. Yeah. They're not trying to prove it or disprove it, but they might not like the implications of it. So I set out in my book, I described how I wanted to test God experimentally. And, um, you know, Newsflash, I haven't you know published it in nature yet, but there's uh, it's interesting. Uh, and again, I don't care if you if you believe in God at all. I, I never actually in Judaism, you know what? It's forbidden for me to proselytize. You're actually not allowed to. If somebody if you came to me tomorrow and say, Travis, uh, you said, Brian, I'm so uh, just you're so impressive. And I just love talking to you. It's great. <laughs> I want to convert to Judaism. I'm supposed to say no to you. I'm mm. supposed to test you basically three times. As you're supposed to come and ask uh, for permission to join because we know throughout history, Jews have been persecuted and it's not something you go into lightly thinking about, Oh, I'm just going to like change religions, you know, one day, like Jehovah's witness or something like it's very, very or Scientology or, or whatever. No, you have to do it. You have to be refuted, rejected and op opposed to test sincerity. And then there's a huge process to go through sometimes involving, you know, cutting off a small part of your body, which is, you know, yeah, not yeah. super consequential to some of us, but, but anyway, let me get back to this. The point is um, that you think about it is what I'm so impressed with. And for me, I started to think, well, cosmology is kind of interesting. Even atheists like Fred Hoyle, who coined the term Big Bang as a pejorative, it, it means like orgasm in British English. And he was like, how could you believe the universe had like an orgasm? Like, and he said, the reason that cosmologists believe it is because they're all believing in the Torah, in Genesis 1.1 which is like laughable. I don't think a single, uh, you know, one of my colleagues, I don't, I don't know any of my colleagues who really are devoutly believing in Genesis 1-1, right. but what if you could falsify the Genesis narrative? Would that not at least give some uh, Bayesian prior credence to the atheist argument? And so I set out, there's, there's only two mitzvahs in the Torah that have affirmative proclamations of what's going to happen to you. And one of them happens to be in the Ten Commandments, and it's the Fifth Commandment. The Fifth Commandment says, honor thy mother and thy father, and if you do, your days will be long on the earth. 
Hmm. That's to me, that's a prediction, isn't it? That's it's clear as bell. It doesn't, it's not like, you know, string theory predicts you will find a muon with this magnetic moment. No, 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 no. It's, but it's precise saying something that's testable. Mm -hmm. So you could dishonor your parents and see if you live. Uh, you could honor your parents, see if you die. Or, or, you know, there's all these different uh, Pascal wager type interpretations. Yeah. Superposition. I think I think there, of course, are situations where we could apply that uh, commandment where uh, it would be in a child's best interest to dishonor their parents. No, certainly so. And in fact, that says it was the first time in human history that the woman got equal billing with the with the father. So Judaism impresses me tremendously because we now analyze it based on, oh, we just like we're the most moral individuals that ever lived. We have the highest morality because we stand if we do even acknowledge that we stand on the shoulders of giants. We just think we're getting more and more evolved and getting better. Steven Pinker has been on my show. Better angels of our nature. Everything's getting better, better, better. But in reality, we stand really on in, in a unique spot because the Torah, unique among all uh, religious documents, gave stature and status to women unheard of gave stature and status to slaves. It's not like what you think about in the deep South. It gave status to children that children were not allowed to be killed by their parents. Mm -hmm. uh, and this sounds like barbaric to us, but in some parts of the world, I hate to break it to you. Still things go on to this day, honor killings where you can kill your child. Uh, that does happen in parts of the world. Uh, we don't have to talk about that, but uh, that's this is something 3,000 years ago. Whether you believe it came from God or from this band of Bronze Age nomadic peasants, that's up to you. But there's something marvelous about a document that gave equal status to women as parents, gave religious um, um, and, and theological support to the marriage contract that was purely done to benefit the women. Because before that, as you know, they were treated as chattel. They were property. And now they had their own agency, at least if they did get divorced. Uh, they could say no. They weren't treated purely as pride. Anyway, I'm not going to defend yeah, the Torah, yeah. uh, but I'm just going to say that it was very much ahead of its time. And you can, it's not fair to say, oh, you know, well, you know, it, it had some like evolutionary, you know, benefit or whatever. Because we see today, if evolution is progressing through natural selection to refining the individual, the organism, and the society, why are there still societies that don't obey this? Why are I there still can, Yeah, I think we can look through ancient texts and find good ideas, things that we would call good ideas from, mm -hmm. let's say, a, a human well-being perspective uh like you've just outlined um and uh we can also find some r very bad ideas now i want to i want to jump because you did mention this uh slightly for a moment in case you didn't know i have uh and i and i think you've had ben shapiro on your um yep. on your podcast i have he's coming back yeah. yeah okay great I, well uh hopefully um you can uh tell ben when he does come back that i'll be waiting for him uh or Pangburn is waiting for him on the uh, ideological battlefield on this issue. Um, so I've declared ideological war on Ben Shapiro for his stance on male genital mutilation or uh, circumcision. Um, he seems to want to make sure that him and others should be able to do this, uh, you know, to their baby boys. Um, and he doesn't want that right taken away. Uh, and it's hard for me to imagine a more barbaric, disgusting and immoral uh, act uh, now that's my perspective. Okay. And, and how do you feel about circumcision? I've had it done. I actually had to have it done a second time, actually as an adult, because when I was done the first time, it wasn't done by a religious practitioner. Now it was ceremonial. It wasn't actually, you know, uh, done under the same circumstances. Um, so uh, when we look at it, I, you know, there are reasons, and this would be a whole podcast for, you know, for us to debate and discuss sure. this. Um but in my mind, I had it. My sons have had it. Uh, and all my brothers, I have three brothers. I have um, nine. Uh, let's see. I've got nine uncles on one side of the family. I've got four on the other side. Um, not one, Every single one has been circumcised, religiously or not, um, <clears throat> medically or not. Um, not one, you know, that I know of that has come. Now, this is anecdotal. It's not you know, it's not, it's not researched and so forth in terms of scientific studies. Right. But when you phrase it in that way, it's a, it's very difficult to have a conversation when you phrase it in the same way and you call it mutilation, general mutilation. That to me is like when I'm told that if I don't accept the global warming narrative, which I, which I do, but then you're a climate denier to me as a Jew that conjures up notions of Holocaust denial. And mm. to me to, to conflate two things via the same word and, and I actually have people, and I've written critical uh, arguments against this, when people talk, you don't believe in the multiverse, you're a multiverse denier. 
that's a very loaded term. It's like lynching. You know, there's some things you can't, th those terminology is very, is very important for. Um, so someone like Ion Hersey Ali and others have talked about genital mutilation of women at age 13. Now, we're not talking about seven day, an eight day year old boy um, under medical supervision with anesthesia, et cetera, et cetera. You're talking about, you know, something done for, for reasons that are said to be, you know, explicit in the Quran. We're not, I'm not going to get into that either. But the point being, um, this, this, you know, tradition has, has, you know, been going on for thousands of years, obviously. Uh, and, um, and it is the foremost, you know, thing, the very first commandment that Abraham does. And again, this is something I had done as an adult and it wasn't, uh, a, you know, to call it mutilation, I think is risking this conflation that I find, uh, can, can lead us away from a productive path of discussion simply because it becomes allied with people who traffic in things like female genital mutilation, which I stand opposed to and against in all, in all right. cases. And also, by the way, Travis, there is medical evidence of positive benefits of not having a foreskin, not, not necessarily the circumcision. And we can get into that some other time, please. But but of um, you know, lowered rates of certain of certain uh, genetic or um, venereal diseases and other problems that men have. So right. it's it's not without benefit on one hand. It's not something that's perceived psychologically by people, even including me and adults who have had it. Um, and uh, and it's also something that is uh, is you know the core root of a of a, of a tradition which was outlawed throughout history. Uh, I don't have to tell you this, but it was always outlawed in every in every uh, culture that did outlaw circumcision. It was always done also concomitantly with the banning and pogroms and eventual Holocaust in, in certain in certain cases. So mm. Jews is a very, very fraught topic, not because we don't want to talk about it or we don't care about babies. I mean, come on. The most num the number one growing group of Jews in, in America and the world are the Orthodox who practice the circumcision literally religiously. Right. Yeah. And, and look, uh, uh, I understand this position and this is a difficult topic and I don't use these labels loosely. I truly do believe this and I'm happy, you know, in a future discussion, if, if we wanted to have one to talk about the actual data. Um, I, I just want to say to people listening, uh, doctors opposing circumcision.org has, um, uh, I think the best collection of, of data on this uh, on this topic, and there is an alleged medical benefits section there. Um, right. So, uh, yeah, we didn't but, get to the actual refutation of the Torah, but um, but we should maybe uh, maybe I have an interview that's coming yeah. up in a little bit. But I did want to just say that I do resonate with what you're saying, in that you would like to convert uh, beliefs to evidence. You a couple of times, like, what do I believe is the best is the best. And and those are fair questions because I know what you're saying colloquially, but in terms of what a scientist wants to do. Now, you also have to stipulate to me that it may not be possible, A, or it may take a long time that will exceed my lifespan to do it. But in principle, I think the falsification of the Torah would have incredible ramifications. And it's not something that would cause me to stop practicing, which is interesting, mm -hmm. right? Because if you falsify the no, because I think that there's legitimate reason to uh, to support and practice these things like charity. Would you say at some point, like God, let's say God does exist, as Pascal would wager, you know, and you and you and you did give uh, you know ten percent of your income, but you didn't give you know fifty percent? Uh, don't you think that that is better preferable to the person on the street? You know, in other words, people say, like, why does that guy have to have his name on the hospital over there? I'm looking at a hospital named after it turns out a Jewish man named yeah. Erwin Jacobs uh, here in San Diego. Uh, but uh, so he's got his name in the hospital. Like, does he have to do that? Does he have to put his name on it? Would it be, wouldn't have been better for him to give it, you know, and just give it away to something else or science? No, the guy and the guy doesn't care. The guy who needs the 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 heart transplant. Do you care if he gave it because he wanted to give it or because he is commanded to give it? Mm -hmm. So for me, my obsession is, is falsifying the Torah. To, can it be falsified? Mm -hmm. Because you hear all sorts of crazy things, and I'm sure you've had people on like the Bible codes. Have you heard the Bible codes, Travis? Uh, the Bible codes. That doesn't and it predicts in Hebrew that the assassination. Oh, of the yeah, 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 yeah. So there yeah. are things, and those things are embarrassing. OK, so every every per, one of my friends, Dennis Prager is a good friend of mine. He'd be a good person to debate also about male circumcision. Uh, but he talks about, um, you know, the one, I don't care what religion you are as long as you're embarrassed about it. But I think sometimes atheists are a little too self-contented 
I don't want to say smug, but um, but that, you know, that this is the best way to be. And then you see them writing books about this from my friend Sean Carroll and, you know, kind of this full throated defense of humanism. And I, I ultimately have to find the fruit as Jesus Christ, who's not my savior personally, said, judge the tree. Ye shall judge it by its fruits. And I see a lot of tremendous fruit in the in the in the Judeo Christian world, in the Muslim world, uh, when when um, when I encounter uh, friends of that faith, and um, and I ask, you know, can it be can it be supported or can it be falsified? That to me is my life's work. And so the fact that it happens to co-align with the telescopes and receivers and technology and theories that I'm expertly qualified in, that just makes it all the better. But I think everybody should wrestle with it. It yeah. really isn't. Like you obviously are wrestling with it uh, and thinking about it. I don't think like I, I don't think it's possible, as you say, to convince something using evidence of something that is believed upon by faith. I just don't think yeah. it's possible. I, I agree with that, too. And, and this is one of the reasons why I, I, I try to promote that. I, I think it's best for humanity and it's best for our, our technological uh, future to believe in as many true things and as few false things as possible. Um and, you know, I have, I think my moral foundation is uh, superior and clarified um, to, and, and simply for the reason, because you do not have to uh, use faith in order to do the things that, that you're talking about. Like you mentioned, uh, the, the, the donating the wing of the hospital. Um, uh, I operate uh, on a moral foundation uh, where I seek to maximize well-being for myself and those around me and not just like a subjective idea of well-being, but the, the well-being that we would measure from a, a clinical perspective, from a medical perspective in the hospitals and in the doctor's office. So that's kind of uh, uh, my moral foundation, what carries me forward and what actually does uh, produce you know, me donating part of uh, the money I make to to causes I think do uh, promote the flourishment of well-being in society. Um, but but I think there there is a way to to be good and to uh, to do good without needing um, faith in your life. But I do understand that uh, you know the the um, the inspirational power people get from uh, religious belief in gods it, uh, can manifest itself in a very positive way yeah. in, in their, in their work, whether it's in the scientific realm or not. So yeah, it could be a negative, it could be a positive, yeah. anything, you know, yeah. I, I guess the, 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 you know, the final thing just before I have to wrap up yeah, and go, sure. and I guess we'll be back on later together as well, yeah. which I look forward to in conversation with your private audience is, um, you know, is, is really never stopping thinking about the deepest questions. Because if you do, I think life is a gift, whether you don't believe in God or not. And we're only here for such a short period of yes. time. You think about Galileo, you think about these names, and you think about what drives us to do stuff. Like, I'm sure you have like a goal and like you're, you're about to hit 100,000 subscribers and it's right there. And, and it's like, you know, it's, it's, it could, it's like a kosher idol. Like, it's, it's okay. You're like, that's fine because you're using it to inspire, to do good. We may not agree on all the charities or choices or, you yeah. know, but that's fine. You're doing something active. You're contributing to the, to the betterment of the world in your capacity. And you're not a freaking slug. You're doing something active. And I just say that about, about everything I do. And that's why I'm a very strong advocate for parenthood, whether that be actual biological parents, but also in terms of mentorship and ideological parents. I mentored, you know, as of yesterday, 13 PhD students, all different, you know, genders, identities, um, uh, uh, upbringings, religions. And, um, and it's a huge responsibility. And I don't just do it because I, you know, get to teach them about cosmology. I become part of their lives. Yeah. And that's the greatest honor that I have. And anybody can do that. You don't have to have biological children to be an inf to be a father figure. We're coming up on Father's yeah, Day, right? Yeah. It's Sunday. Yeah. And 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 you're a father, you're acting like a father to millions, you know, hundreds of thousands of people almost uh, so far. And uh and and you're influencing them and and there can be good without God. I agree 100%. And um and and I but I also believe that um that the quest is more important than the destination. Like you may never get the Nobel yeah. Prize you know, you may never get to, um, you know, the Fields Medal or the Olympic trials or, or whatever, but just as you can never really like, have you ever been happy, Travis? And you're just like, ah, this is awesome. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you've been happy, right? Yeah. How, but 
it doesn't last like permanently, right? Like, I don't know too many people like permanently always happy at that state. Like, you know, let's say my daughter gets married or like, I'll be pretty stoked, you know, that day or whatever, but like your daughter doesn't get married every day. Hopefully, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. So, and why is that? I've come to believe that it's actually connected with the arrow of time. Mm. It's connected to the second law of thermodynamics, which determines an arrow of time, meaning that entropy, which is the amount of disorder, chaotic or accessible microstates that a system mm -hmm. can take on. Um, how many ways could I make your life right now a uh, hundred times better, Travis? Oh, like money. I could give you money. I could give you subs. I could whatever. I mean, like yeah. legitimately, I can't, you can't, it's hard to like 10 X or nearly, right? nearly an infinite amount of ways. Right. Uh, there, there really? are, there, well, I think so. I think like even an ice cream cone on my doorstep, like there's a, there, but there's you can only so eat one things. ice cream cone at a time. You can only marry one man or one woman at a time or, you know, be like, yeah, if, yeah. if I say like, you can 10 X your happiness, I'll give you 10 wives. I'd be like, holy, that doesn't sound like <laughs> good to me, man. No. Yeah. No, I, <laughs> I love my wife. That there's but also an infinite thing things, uh, infinite amount of things that I think you could send me that I would, that would probably not make me happy and, and probably, well, that's what I'm getting at. So, yeah. so like I had, you know, one of the world's richest men, Jim Simons on, you know, something like, what is the purpose of wealth? You can only water ski behind one yacht at a time, right? You can only fly in one right. Gulf stream at a time. Mm -hmm. So I said, what is the purpose? And we get into that, like wealth is, is energy, wealth is power, but, but, but also, um, but you're absolutely right there. In my mind, there are far more ways I could make your life worse than make your life better. Mm. I could make your life better a little bit incrementally. Like I said, my greatest happiness comes from my wife and kids. If you 10 X my wife and kids, it's misery, right? Yeah. That's the number yeah. one significance in your relationships. Like if you had 10 times more friends, it's different than 10 times more subscribers. Travis, if you have 10 times more friends. You're not going to have time. You're, you're no, a limited. Yeah. Fine. I can't write. So, yeah. But how can I make your life 10 times worse? Easily, easily. Right. Mm. And so think about that. And that's where I think the meaning of life comes through in the arrow of time. And, and we can talk about that maybe later this afternoon, but um, yeah. I had a lot of fun. Okay. I got to yeah. get that up. Thank next you so day. much, uh, Brian. I really appreciate your good. I hope that people will check out my and channel and uh, yes, head over search Brian, Brian Keating. Uh, yeah, Check out the interview I did with Steven Strogatz today. It's pretty deep. And then uh, two o'clock today, we're back on, right, my friend? Yeah, we'll be on Discord for the exclusive Q and A with Dr. Brian Keating. Thank gotta you get so on much. That. You got you got me on Discord, so you have to explain to me how to use it. I, yeah, I yeah. wasn't using it really that much. I'll I know help you Eric, <laughs> Eric Weinstein uses it. I'm trying to send some of his subs over there too. Yeah, cool, man. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot. See you later. Bye, yeah. guys. Bye. Well, everyone, that was Dr. Brian Keating. I really enjoyed that. Uh, yeah, in a couple hours at two p.m. Uh, Pacific time, uh, Dr. Keating will be uh, joining us. Uh, thanks. A huge shout out to Dal Su, who's in the comment section right now on YouTube. Dal Su, uh, hit up Dr. Brian Keating for me and, uh, and, uh, set this up. I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, I will, uh, you know, see if Brian wants to have me over on his channel again, go over there and uh, check it out. Subscribe if you enjoy his content. Uh, I, I really, really, really enjoy interlocking with people who understand good faith discourse and helpfulness um, in conversation. I, I, I just, I can't say enough about how much I loved that conversation with Brian that we just had. Podcast 58 is in the, uh, in the books. Um, Alexander MB, Randolph Richardson, Thomas Panter, Drone Racer, Jimmy Wright, all you guys in the comment section. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, if you enjoyed this podcast, please drop a like and consider subscribing. Uh, many more great guests coming your way soon. Join us on Discord. Uh, and another shout out to Daltsu for uh, connecting Brian and myself together. Uh, I really enjoyed it. 2 p.m. Pacific time on Discord. You need to be a Pangburn subscriber, an official website subscriber to get access to the exclusive Q&A. So please consider going to pang-burn.com forward slash subscription and signing up for a monthly subscription. Thank you guys so much. And as always, let art and science inspire.